Hi, you're listening to The Sociology Show, a podcast about absolutely anything to do with the wonderful world of sociology. Whether you're a teacher, a lecturer, a student, or just taking a passing interest, this podcast will look at a range of issues from social class, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, religion, crime, education, and anything else that sociology has to offer. My name is Matthew Wilkin, and each episode I will speak to someone working in the field of sociology and let them explain all about their own interests, their research, and their experiences. So, put your earphones in, turn the volume up, and let's be sociology geeks together, eh? Hello, and welcome back to a new series of the Sociology Show podcast. I hope you've enjoyed your summer break. If you're in the UK or just enjoyed yourselves in general, wherever you are in the world, um, thanks to the, the wonders of modern technology, I can now see where everyone downloads a show from. So I know that most of you are in the UK, quite a few of you are in America and Australia, but I can see that people are listening in far flung places, Taiwan, Brazil, Peru, Indonesia, Canada, and uh, I'm also interested, there's one regular downloader in Andorra as well. So thank you very much to all of you who do download the show on a, on a regular basis. So before we get stuck into the interview for today, I would firstly like to introduce a new sponsor for the show, and that's in the form of Collins. Now, Collins produce high quality student books, teacher guides, and unbeatable value revision resources for GCSE and A-level sociology. Now, the Sociology Show listeners can get 25% off Collins Sociology resources until the end of December 2021. And that includes a new book, How to Be a Sociologist, an inspiring introduction to studying sociology at A-level and university. So if you are interested in purchasing that book or you want to see what other resources Collins have on offer and you want to get 25% off, good deal that then simply head to collins.co.uk forward slash sociology and enter the code sociology show at the checkout. Terms and conditions apply, but 25% off in particular, if you want to check out that book, How to Be a Sociologist, then please, please do check out. I'll give you that uh, website address again. That's collins.co.uk forward slash sociology. And so the Sociology Show podcast continues to also be brought to you in association with Tutor to You Sociology, the exam performance specialist for A-level and GCSE sociology students and teachers. And so they've got a website as well. You can check out what they've got on offer if you visit tutor to you dot net forward slash sociology and there you can pick up revision guides flashcards revision videos and everything else that you need for your a level or gcse sociology studies and so on to our first guest of the new series then and i was delighted to interview dr chris till from the leeds beckett university and chris's specialist areas are to do with health new media and technologies and so without further ado let's go over to the interview with dr chris till Chris, thank you very much for joining me. Hi, Matthew. So, Chris, I always ask people to start by telling us a, a little bit about who they are and what they do, if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, um, my name's Chris. Um, I'm a, a, a senior lecturer at Leeds Beckett University, uh, So, I, and I'm a sociologist. I'm there in, in the sociology group in the School of Social Sciences. Um, I've been there for about eight years or so, and I've, been, I've taught and done research at a, a few other places before that. Uh, my teaching and my research is mostly around kind of health and technologies, particularly kind of new media uh, kind of technologies. I'm quite uh, quite theoretically interested as well and, and draw on quite a few different kind of uh, theoretical approaches. Excellent, excellent. And, and technologies in particular, what, what drew you into that area? I know that's going to be the sort of main area that we, we chat about today. Why the interest in that? Are you a techie yourself, Chris? Uh, not that much I've, I've become more like that I wasn't really a, when I was sort of a teenager and, uh, and and that kind of age I wasn't really at all I think I've more got into it through being sort of sociologically interested in it really yeah um, and I think I got um, I got interested in it really because through a kind of a theoretical interest through I, I got really into uh, Michel Foucault who probably a lot of your listeners will be familiar with um, when I was doing my undergraduate degree and my postgraduate degree. And it was through his kind of way of understanding technologies in this really broad sense, uh, not just sort of machines and devices and things like that, but um, what he talks about is kind of technologies of the self and technologies of government and, and that kind of thing. So it's as much about kind of ways of understanding the world 
um, ways of kind of maybe exerting control over other people or ourselves as it is about actual devices. But it is those things as well. Yeah. And most people are obviously aware of sort of political biases and how the media is controlled. But you go into it in a lot more depth, don't you? Just just how much of what we're seeing and reading is possibly not true or far from true, should we put it that way? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I mean, we're, we're probably going to particularly talk about this the, the, this particular article that, uh, that I've written. And what I try to do in there really is to, uh, it's really an attempt for me to get my head around what was going on, uh, what, what's going on, on on kind of social media and the internet more generally. And there isn't really a distinction between social media and the rest of our lives mm. uh, anymore, if there ever was, um, really. Um, but actually, the way that social media functions and the way we need to understand it, I think, is as a kind of a fundamental aspect of social life, of sociality, and also the way it's integrate, deeply integrated into both our social lives and also the kind of the broad economy, political economy, if you like, of the internet and the rest of the world uh, around us. And yeah, it, it's, it, it, it's becoming, I think, increasingly difficult to make distinctions between, potentially for a lot of people, between what's true and what's not true online, precisely because that's actually been an express uh, intention for some groups to actually disturb that and an in- unintentional outcome of some behaviors is has been to disturb those notions of truth and false you, you already mentioned Foucault there but a lot of the postmodernists, I'm thinking of Zygmunt Bauman in particular they, they kind of predicted mm. this didn't they um, talk of hyper reality and those sort of those sort of key terms this has been predicted for a long time this is the direction we were going in yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So all those, yeah, Bauman, Leotard and um, Baudrillard, and, uh, all those kinds of people have said this for a long time. Obviously, they were, well, um, Bauman was writing until just a couple of years ago, but many of them were writing some of that stuff in the 1970s, 1980s. So obviously, they, they were seeing it a long time before the internet, certainly as, as we know it today, and the kinds of things we're, we're talking about in terms of social media. Um, and I think that that just goes to show that these processes are much longer, uh, longer term, and that we do need to see them in that broader context of a kind of a, a broader media economy uh, and kind of social social context as well. So, do you want to tell us a little bit more about your your specific research into this area, and um, maybe in terms of your methodology and what your sort of overall hypothesis is? Yeah, so uh, I've been looking at it really, uh, as I said before, it, it, I'm trying to kind of fundamentally just trying to conceptually analytically get my head around what the situation is that's going on and I started to think about as as many of us have done over the last couple of years or so that there seems to be this problem with what's been called sort of fake news or Mm. um, disinformation and uh, and and these kinds of problems and I, I wondered what was kind of going on there and I also started to think about what was my role in that if any, and I felt like actually it wasn't very useful, for instance, to say that, you know, that I'm someone who I think I'm intelligent and I'm critical and I don't get fooled by, uh, you know, lies or, or, or disinformation online. Uh, and then there's other people over there who maybe they get more easily tricked because they're, you know, they're not as smart as me. I didn't really think that that was what was going on, whereas there was a bit of a discourse around that. And what I started to see when I was looking into this, that actually there's, there's, there's all kinds of strategies uh, going on uh, of various different groups who've got different interests in, 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 in their own political and economic kind of positions, and also just everyday social behaviours which are instigate, uh, implemented in this. So I started to see this through a kind of... Um, uh, I started to think about this in terms of, of propaganda, because I uh, observing what was going on, I started to think about actually, is this something like propaganda, um, where actually people are, some people are deliberately uh, trying to kind of manipulate how we understand the world, how we understand what's go- uh, 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 our, our our day to day lives, our relationships with other people, in order to to uh, produce certain kind of political outcomes, whether that's to try to encourage you to vote in this way or that way or to, to get you to kind of get angry with this group um, um, or, or that group uh, in order to kind of change your political 
perspective. Uh, and I thought that that was, to me, that was clearly going on. Uh, and all the kinds of things that we saw, the kind of revelations around um, potential um, uh, potential interference of different uh, uh, governments in, in elections. We know that's gone on for a long time, really, but increasingly using uh, social media and internet kind of methods. Uh, but also the kind of uh, the, the revelations around the Cambridge Analytica yes. um, groups kind of um, uh, influence uh, or purported influence on, on, on various elections and votes uh, around the world. Um, and it started to make me think, well, hmm, can we can we understand this through kind of a propaganda lens? Uh, but at the same time, I had this other this other side where I was thinking, uh, actually, there's a lot of people who are potentially actually part of this issue, everyday Internet users like myself, who aren't obviously involved in propaganda. And but do, do these two things kind of come together? And the more and more I looked into how um, platforms like Facebook and Twitter um, function, the more that those things seem to come together as well. And I came across this, this concept um, from a Russian kind of intelligence work, Russian statecraft, um, Russian kind of spying, developed in the mid 20th century of reflexive control. And what this referred to was the way in which uh, Russian kind of spy agencies um, would try to manipulate an enemy um, of some kind, a political enemy, a military kind of enemy, and they would try to manipulate them to, to behave in a particular way, but as if it was coming from their own kind of organic um, uh, understanding, their own organic interpretation of the situation. Mm. So they, 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 what they would do, um, or the kind of the philosophy of their approach, was to, in their terms, to kind of manipulate the filters of that person. So uh, manipulate the way that, that person filters information, the way that they deal with information that comes into them. Um, and they would do that by profiling that person. Um, so this was always high-level kind of military leaders, high-level politicians. They would get information on that, on that person, on their kind of their likes, their dislikes, their kind of psychological dispositions, um, all those kinds of, uh, th that kind of data. And then they would find ways to kind of to fire information at them, which may be true or may not be true, in order to destabilize their, their perception of the world, their, their perception of truth, and therefore make them more manipulable in, in their terms. And what I started to think was, well, we've all got these kinds of profiles on us now. Well, everyone who's got a social media account does anyway. Um, you know, uh, uh, all these social media platforms produce what some kinds called psych psychographic profiles or just data on our likes, our dislikes, our, uh, our relationships with other people, our, our, um, our, our kind of uh, interests. And they target us with information, usually in the form of advertising. And I wondered if this was what was going on and this could be hijacked for these kinds of political purposes. So if, if that were true, which I'm guessing there's, there is an element of truth to it, how would that actually work? What's the kind of mechanics of it, if you like? Yeah, so um, we saw this a lot in some of those kinds of instances. We, we've mentioned the Cambridge Analytica um, uh, revelations and, and those kinds of things. But it works in, in, in various different ways. Uh, first of all, obviously, the platform produces these kinds of profiles on us. And they get this from, in, in terms of Facebook, um, literally, if you like something, that tells them something about that. If you like a, a, a movie, if you like a, a brand like Nike, uh, that, tells the, that tells the platform something about you. Um, all, but all of your interactions with, with the platform tell them something about you. And they, they produce these, these profiles on us, which are useful for targeting us with advertising. So if you understand someone's psychology, then you can target them with advertising and try to, um, try to convince them to buy something. Of course, it didn't take very long for political actors, um, legitimate political actors, uh, 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 candidates in, in elections, to see that that could be used for, for their own purposes as well. So we saw that. I think I think probably the, one of the first times that was that was done was actually in the I think the, the 2008 uh, U.S. presidential election. Barack Obama used a lot of that kind of data initially in his campaign. 
Um, but it's become much more prominent all around the world since then. Um, so we start to see a kind of a political connection there. But then what that starts to do is to, to fit together with the kind of the broader kind of infrastructure of, of the internet and, and of how sort of social media advertising works. Um, and see, the, the thing is, these kinds of platforms aren't or haven't until quite recently been very interested in, or, or, or been very uh, discerning about who they sell advertising to. They'll do it to anyone. And actually, this advertising kind of system works in a very, um, in such a high speed way that it is quite hard to, to monitor because what happens every time an advert is presented to you, whether that's on, on social media or on any kind of website, essentially a tiny little auction happens um, within a few, within less than a second between various kind of potential advertisers. That's why when a web page loads, the main content of, you know, uh, of a news site, whatever loads, and then about a second later, the, the adverts load, because yeah. then there's a tiny little auction going on uh, of people competing over access to you. And so these things happen at very high speed. And so that's how we get those kind of adverts delivered to us. But what I, what I kind of, consider is that at the same time that this is going on we're all kind of part of that process so in order for those kind of profiles to exist of us we have to be putting all our data into these into these platforms and and engaging with them all the time so we're kind of implicated in this but also uh, at the same time those advertising systems can be manipulated so there's, I think there's people that are kind of producing this kind of disinformation, this kind of false information, who aren't necessarily politically aligned to um, uh, the people who may or may not benefit from that. And so in the, in the paper, I talk about the case, uh, which has been quite widely reported, of some um, teenagers in Macedonia who um, set up a very successful um, a kind of series of websites with um, totally false information. This is in the run up to the Donald Trump's first, uh, uh, well, first presidential run, well, the 2016 presidential run. Um, false information, um, particularly about Hillary Clinton um, and sort of pro Trump um, uh, uh, news, which was entirely fabricated just because they realized that. Th- through uh, advertising that through Facebook, they could get a huge amount of views to their websites, which also had advertising on them. Mm. And then they could charge decent money for the adverts that were on their sites. So they found ways to manipulate that kind of infra- that advertising infrastructure of both social media and of kind of web, the, the, the broader World Wide Web. Um, and it just so happened that the content which was the most valuable to these, um, uh, 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 to them in the advertising infrastructure was um, basically fake news um, about Trump, about about Hillary Clinton. So, I mean, that's a really good in, in, um, example, actually, because my next question was going to be, uh, who is they? You know, we often say they are trying yeah. to get us to vote this way or to vote Brexit or to support Black Lives Matter or whoever it is. You've just given one example, yeah. but, but who in general is the they pushing that content? So I, I think that I, I talk about there being kind of essentially three categories of people involved in this. And again, this is, this is actually a categorization I take from, from that kind of Russian spycraft, statecraft uh, literature. And they talk about there being uh, the, these kind of three groups of people who are involved in that, which is what they, uh, three groups of what they call agents of influence, people who are having an influence on uh, on on uh, on how people understand the world and, and uh, distributing this kind of propaganda. There's um, fully employed agents of influence, locally recruited and unwitting. And I think that those Macedonian teenagers are uh, an example of the kind of the locally recruited. Uh, they're not actually employed by uh, kind of necessarily kind of a, a political actor like a government or a politician, but they somehow get caught up in that. And in this case, it's just some people who found out they could make make a uh, uh, make a decent income um, from from spreading that propaganda. Uh, but probably the most significant, well, in one sense, most significant is what I refer to as fully employed agents of influence. So these are groups such as um, the uh, Russia's Internet Research Agency, um, who um, 
who have been widely reported as the interfering in 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 foreign um, elections, such as the the kind of uh, elections in the UK, particularly the Bre- the, the um, EU referendum, the Brexit referendum, and the presidential elections in the United States, and they use all kinds of tactics to manipulate the discourse um, online. So most significantly, they set up, set up um, what's called sock puppet accounts on social media. So these are kind of just fake profiles um, uh, in order to kind of to spread particular messages. And, and, and actually to try to make real world, um, I'm using that distinction again, even though I said I, I shouldn't, but make a kind of real world things happen. So we know that they have, um, that they have kind of essentially created um, protests um, uh, by kind of stirring up, uh, stirring up kind of uh, um, uh, tensions between different groups and intervening actually on both sides, for instance, of, 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 of kind of Black Lives Matter kind of yeah. arguments. Uh, and of immigration arguments and things like that. And I've actually set up the, the initial Facebook groups um, for, for protests in some cases on both sides. There's other groups, um, such as there's, there's an, an Israeli-based um, uh, uh, group called uh, PSY, but there's been reports of, of other ones uh, recently in the, um, uh, the, the Guardian's reporting, it was at the Pegasus, I think, um, uh, which are essentially are kind of um, uh, doing the same kinds of thing as as the Russian Internet Research Agency, but just doing it for hire for, for other uh, actors and other governments. Um, and, you know, the, the, they, they've, they quite openly tout their kind of their skills and, and their work around. But actually, it seems all governments are doing this. And uh, the, the UK government has what's referred to as called the, uh, the, the 77th Brigade. So this is a sort of a division within the British Army, uh, which... Uh, recruits uh, people to work for them in what they refer to as unconventional warfare um, to target um, social media and psychological operations. Um, and this is to quote, this is just openly on their kind of website. They say that they use behavioral analysis to adapt behaviors of the opposing forces and adversaries. So it's, it's almost exactly what I'm describing yeah. with reflexive control. Um, so um, this is where the kind of the kind of the cyber warfare, the psychological, psychological operations are are happening in this kind of field, and really, th- th- there's many different groups who are who are uh, active in that. The Sociology Show podcast relies on the kind contributions of sponsorship and donations. If you enjoy the show, then you can help with the hosting costs by donating as little as five pounds on the GoFundMe page. Simply visit uk.gofundme.com and search for the Sociology Show. If you can donate, then you will be sent a Sociology Show pen as a small thank you for your continued support of the show. Because that's something that really interests me that you just said. I, I can kind of see it quite often if, if you're on Instagram, you're, if you're on um, looking at kind of, I won't name them actually, okay? <laughs> but, but certain groups, they, they put out a story which is clearly there to spark a debate. I was just looking, you know, something like um, a story about the trans Olympian or men are much better at women than X, Y, Z study yeah. shows. And you just think they are clearly there, those stories, because they know they are going to get traction. They're going to get an argument going. So actually, is it, is it more about generating traffic than actually sitting on one side of the debate? Uh, it's, it's not necessarily about generating traffic. It, it could be. Um, I mean, one of the problems with this as well is that it it's, can be quite difficult to discern between these kind of paid actors, these kind yeah. of sock puppets, um, bots, which they also use, uh, who are just there to amplify a message, you know, automated accounts, mm-hmm. and genuine people with genuine opinions, um, and then also just trolls, people who literally just want to stay out trouble yeah. just because they think it's funny to do so. Um, so it is quite difficult to discern between them. But I think particularly what's the case, and certainly with the, the, the Russian case, with the Internet Research Agency, it, it's, it's not so much about traffic as such as just disturbing our understanding of what is true, yeah. just trying to sow confusion and discord uh, and argument. Um, it, it, it then has... I would say the people who are most interested in driving traffic is the, is the platforms. It's the, it's the Instagrams, the Twitters, the Facebooks. They're all about, obviously, they just need more and more traffic all the time, yes. I think. Um, uh, with, uh, actually, an, an interesting example, uh, which is slightly different to that, and I, which I talk about in the paper, is how that kind of propaganda occurs in China for their internal kind of 
internal audience, if you like, of Chinese citizens, which is actually, uh, they actually don't so much try to sow discord in this way, but they, they just try to drown out negativity. Mm. So they, they use sock puppets, accounts, um, what they refer to, it was, sometimes referred to as the 50, 50 cent army, uh, because they're actually paid by the, gov- uh, the, the Chinese government, although they're not paid 50 cents, that's kind of a myth. <laughs> but um, uh, they're paid just to kind of drown out negativity. And they do that just with essentially cheerleading for the government, saying how great th- this policy is, how great something that the government's done is, and just try to just, just kind of push it to one side. It's, it's interesting you say about causing that divide because increasingly I'm seeing this, that you have to be on one side or the other. You are either pro-Brexit mm. or you're anti-Brexit. You are either left-wing or you're right-wing. You are either pro-trans rights or anti-trans rights, whatever it may be. That it's very clever at causing that divide and you, you're expected to sit in one side of the camp and stick with it, aren't you? Yeah, I, I think so. And certainly some studies have shown... Um, uh, I think particular. Uh, well, I think it, it does happen here. But the students that I've seen, particularly, have been in America. That the, the political divides have have got more solid. You know, for, I think so a big survey was done, uh, maybe by Pew. I think Pew Research Group, who uh, where they, they found that over time people have become less tolerant, for instance, of their children um, uh, being in a relationship with someone of the opposing. You know. A, 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 being in a relationship with a Democrat if they're Republican and vice versa. Oh, wow. um, you know, it does seem that these divisions have kind of um, have, have solidified. And, and of course, that's something that we've seen um, promoted, that kind of division uh, at all levels of politics, of kind of formal politics. Um, that certainly happened, uh, like you said, uh, around Brexit um, uh, and in America around uh, 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 all, all Trump's kind of actions, um, but it is there. It is there? It's there right through the discourse. I think now, um, and it to me that does that does benefit these kinds of political actors that I'm that I'm talking about. And I suppose ultimately. We are aware of it. I think most people are aware that there's a huge amount of fake news out there, that we are being targeted, that these kind of things do exist, but we still fall into it. You know, I have to punch myself sometimes for getting into a Twitter debate or something like that. You know, we're, we're all victims of it and we all kind of fall for it. And we're, we're all guilty of seeing something online and starting to share that information without even checking it first. Why is that happening, Chris? You know, we're talking about a, a, a lot of people are falling for it, if you like. Yeah, I, I don't know if I've got a good answer to that. Other than, <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I, I do think, and, and that's really where the, the kind of the third of my kind of categories comes in, which is the unwitting agents of influence, which I think is essentially all of us. You yeah. know, um, and that's always been present in, in any kind of propaganda. If you, you know, if you agree with me, want to see it in those terms of people just spreading that information around once they've heard it. And the, the problem with that is, is that that is a fundamental social thing. Um, and that's a, a fundamental aspect of sociality, of our, uh, all our social beings. That's what we do. We, we, we share things, we share information. And these social media platforms, of course, are set up to enable that. They're all about, they're all about that because that drives more engagement, more traffic, and therefore more data for them. So um, we, we, we always inevitably will, will do this. Um, but that's why I think to come back to something I mentioned earlier on that I think it's I think we can be very hard on other people and often on ourselves as well, um, saying that you know this person or me has been stupid and has just shared this without thinking you know whatever. And um, this is why in the paper I draw on a, a, an old, sometimes forgotten, so 19th century sociologist, French sociologist called Gabriel Tard, and he has this kind of notion of sociality which is quite distinct. Well, he, he was a big enemy of Emile Durkheim and uh, they, they had totally opposing views. Uh, for, for, for Tard, um, all, everything is about innovation and imitation in, in society. And we get little bits of innovation, like when someone just creates a new word or makes a new meme or, a new, uh, or creates a new hashtag, you know, if you want to see it in those terms. And then it gets imitated a lot as it, get, and as it gets copied and shared. And this happens in all aspects of social life. So that, that, that sharing and that imitating is so fundamental to what we are as, 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 as kind of social beings, I think. So it's quite hard to, to kind of stop that. But um, I think where that becomes particularly dangerous here and problematic is that that is feeding into that broader 
economy of social media and, and, and of the internet that, you know, that in the process of us doing that, uh, we're amplifying those kinds of th- those messages or, or, ampl- or uh, increasing those divides, perhaps, that you mentioned. But also we're feeding that machine with more data. You know, every t- everything we do online, you know, helps create those profiles. So those profiles which are used to target us, we've created. Um, and um, it's fundamentally, it's, it's not possible for us to, to kind of necessarily... To, to fact check every, every single word that we use, everything that we share necessarily. Um, if we actually, if we use social media in the way it's intended to be used, because it's been designed, I think, for us not to think about it. Um, and I kind of draw on this notion of kind of it, what, what a lot of the kind of, I think a lot of the digital world in general does. It tries to construct us to, um, um, tries to encourage us rather to re- react uh, in an almost automatic fashion um, and to be reactive rather than reflective that um, the the automatic thing to do is to is to kind of to retweet before reading almost and certainly before fact checking and I mean these platforms have put in a lot of stuff or trying to put in a lot of stuff um, you know automated and and human led kind of fact checking services you know they've started to actually um, take people off the platform or take sources off the platform just the other day. Uh, YouTube banned, I think, Sky News in Australia uh, because they've been sharing essentially COVID misinformation, um, uh, uh, according to their their kind of assessment anyway. And of course, Trump has been taken off uh, off all the major platforms as well. But that could never that can never be. I don't think that that could ever be done on the on the, on the scale that's needed. Um, and so it is something that I think and why I kind of went for this kind of these three kind of categories because I think it is something we all need to think about. We all need to take, take account of, um, but also to not assume that other people who are sharing things or are spreading ideas that we don't agree with are duped, are stupid, are uncritical because that will probably be yours at some point. Uh, you know, I, I've certainly, I've certainly done it before, and I try to be as careful as possible. And I don't, I'm not as active as a lot of people are online, but it still happened. And uh, to be a bit more kind of sympathetic with one another, uh, but still to keep, but to keep being critical of that situation. And actually, the fight isn't between me and you and and and, and other people we know. It's it we're we're part of this much broader infrastructure with, with political and um, uh, economic interests all kind of fighting this out. And we should try not to play their game for them, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I've just finished reading um, Douglas Murray, Madness of Crowds, which I know a lot of sociologists probably won't like. But I'm trying to read <laughs> some stuff out my out my comfort zone. And that really taps into exactly what he said, that this process of imitation. That, you know, if you get something like a hashtag, if it's repeated over and over again, the mantra, it mm. somehow becomes facts in people's minds, even if it's not particularly logical. You know, some of the, some of the hashtags, some of the statements, some of the political movements uh, are not actually logical, but they've been imitated so many times and repeated or retweeted so many times that becomes fact in someone's mind. And yeah, I think you're right. I think anyone could be, is dupe the right word? I know what you mean though. And anyone I think can be a part of that system. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. And uh, what the reason why I, I, in in some ways, what Gabriel Tard, the the, the, the sociologist I mentioned earlier, uh, says there is, in a sense, there is a bit of a crossover with that Murray stuff, although politically it's very different. But why I find that really useful is because he talks about that in relation to, um, I think what you refer to something like flows of affect and kind of emotion and, 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 and that kind of thing, that actually we get caught up in these, in these affective kind of waves and these, these, kinds of, these kinds of waves of meaning, if you like, kind of flow through us. And, um, but he doesn't mean that in the sense of that we get caught up in, a, in kind of a madness, but again, that that is actually a fundamental part of our kind of social being and the kind of social media platforms and the people who are actively trying to manipulate them are well aware of this. And again, something I mentioned in the paper is that uh, Christopher Wiley, who was kind of one of the Cambridge Analytica whistleblowers, he talks about how they used the kind of the affective relationships people had with brands um, in order to, uh, uh, 
and the kind of narratives that have been built up around those brands and that, you know, a lot of money and work has been put into building up around them over many years as a way of targeting people and a way of, uh, of um, uh, in his case, of, of actively trying to manipulate them. You know, that, that we have these emotional connections to things like brands, but also to political ideas and to people um, uh, and groups. And we, you know... The, that's that's a fundamental part of of our of of who we are of our identities, and mm. um, so that is always part of our logical, rational reasoning um, activities as well. The, the two aren't really separated. When we're kind of thinking about what makes sense to us, what um, what we want to share with other people, that kind of thing, we're not just rational robots yeah. it's part of that emotional engagement as well and i think we really need to probably a lot more work needs to be done to understand that in order to to think about this um you know that the people do w- work with vote with buy with their kind of their hearts as well as their heads i think yeah that would make sense why i found myself liking a tweet that i don't necessarily agree with but i agree Agree with the principles of the person, if that makes sense. I've kind of, yeah. I've kind of ag- agreed with the the sentiment of the individual as opposed to the actual tweet, which is quite a bizarre thing to do. But I guess we're all guilty of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, this, well, this is it, and and it's and, and that's why you know some some messages are easier to kind of stomach mm. um, for some people than others, um, and certain kinds of ideas are easier to kind of to, to engage with. Than others. You know that. I, I, you know, I've, uh, you know, I, I, I would find it really hard to vote for the Conservative Party, <laughs> even if I actually agreed with what they were yeah. saying. Yeah. It would just emotionally to go and kind of stand in a, in a, in a little box and put a tick next to kind of, that, that would I would find that extremely difficult, if, if not impossible, uh, even if I rationally agreed with it, which again, I couldn't, uh, I can't even imagine that, but that's probably how indoctrinated I am, uh, you know, against them. Um, but that that kind of that kind of relationship between our our rational thinking between our uh, our kind of uh, use of logic and our emotions and actually physically i think our physical bodies and how we feel you know yes. that, that's a big part of how emotions function as well uh, uh, is it, it is impossible to separate and and i think that that is again that's a big part of again how these sort of waves of of feeling that tard talks about move through you know um uh, you know, people like Murray might talk about it moving through crowds as in physical crowds. And saying that's something that Emil Durkheim talked about, doesn't it? Um, that, that kind of collective effervescence that we get. But we get emotional, even physical feelings, just sitting at our computer, tweeting something or liking something or receiving likes back or, you know, and things like that, don't we? And that's actually part of that experience. And again, I think we, we need to know more about how that works and about how people actually feel about these things. Um, and... I think sometimes the debates and discussions, which sometimes get very heated and very, you know, and, and personal and things like that online and very nasty, um, aren't, as much as some people might like to think they are, they're not just purely logical arguments. I'm trying to take apart your, your you know, your side of the argument and I'm putting mine logically forward. And if you get angry with me, then you're, you're being emotional and I'm just being logical. That's never the case. Yeah. They're, they're always going together, um, I, I think. And the... I think the, the, maybe that, that emotional aspect makes it sometimes, sometimes harder for us to, to just take, on, take a look logically um, at, at an argument uh, or to accept that we might have been wrong as well. I agree with that. I've been promising myself a, um, a social media hiatus for a long time. <laughs> I, think, I think maybe you've convinced me it's about time. <laughs> uh, Chris, thank you so much for your time today. Could I ask you just to give out a few details about yourself if people want to learn more about you or follow you on Twitter? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so on Twitter, I'm uh, at Chris H. Till, uh, T-I-L-L. Um, they can find my, um, my blog, uh, This Is Not a Sociology dot blog. Um, I'm not as active on those things as you are, but you can find some stuff uh, uh, on there. I've also got two podcasts. So um, uh, one called the uh, Digital Sociology Podcast and one called the Social Theory Podcast. And you can find them just by searching on Spotify, or Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever else, wherever else you go. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time today, Chris, and uh, plenty of food for thought next time we're scrolling through on our phones, which won't be very long, let's be honest. Um, But thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time today, Chris. Really appreciate it.
No problem. Great to talk to you. Thanks again. Thank Bye. you. Bye now. The Sociology Show podcast relies on the kind contributions of sponsorship and donations. If you enjoy the show, then you can help with the hosting costs by donating as little as £5 on the GoFundMe page. Simply visit uk.gofundme.com and search for The Sociology Show. If you can donate, then you will be sent a Sociology Show pen as a small thank you for your continued support of the show. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the podcast. If you would like to contact the show or be interviewed, then please email the Sociology Show podcast at gmail.com.